Let's take our Bibles now and we'll turn to the book of Exodus in chapter 13. The book of Exodus, chapter 13. Of course, we've seen the death of the firstborn of Egypt and the Passover as it has been instituted, how that uh, it created a whole new uh, system of, of, uh, on the calendar. Of course, the, the calendar was set by the Passover. The first month now became um, the, uh, the new year for the children of Israel. And we see that, um, you know, 10 days after that, the, the Passover was to be prepared. Now on the 14th day, uh, it was to be, uh, administered. And, uh, we see now we're going to see a couple other things surrounding the Passover. And of course, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which I have a part of that. But in chapter 13, we see, then the Lord spake to Moses saying, consecrate to me now the firstborn. Whoever or whatever opens the womb among the children of Israel, both man and beast, is mine. Now, interesting, we just see the firstborn of uh, Egypt were killed. But now God says the firstborn of Israel are mine. Now, if you turn back to the book or to Exodus chapter 4, we see that Moses had, the Lord had told Moses uh, to tell Pharaoh, he says, Thus saith the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn, uh, but I say to you, let my son go that he may serve me. And so we see that Jesus, or the, uh, the, the Lord, Jehovah, uh, called uh, Israel his firstborn. Now, of course, Israel would produce the Lord Jesus, and he would be the firstborn among many brethren. And so he's our firstborn, is he not? He's our representative. And so we see that uh, this was a very important position. Now, we have also seen, as we've looked at uh, Genesis and Exodus, that that firstborn was more a position than it was a, 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 a it was more of a position or a, an office than it was a, a, a the the uh, consecutive as far as children we know that uh, Jacob became the firstborn uh, Joseph became the firstborn even though they were born uh, after their older brothers and so we see that uh, that that position is very important to the Lord and it of course Jesus Christ was the firstborn not that he was born at all as far as uh, by the will of man but the will of God but that he has a position as being the representative to God for the rest of the family. And are we not the family of God? So you see how all these things all tie together. And so um, the Lord, uh, uh, and we know that the, as we see that in Exodus, or in, through the whole Old Testament, is a, uh, is, uh, the Old Testament is a mirror or a type for the new. In other words, they, there's so many things that represent uh, that are told to us in the Old Testament that represents something in the New Testament. We know the Passover represents, of course, uh, who, who is our Passover? The Lord Jesus. And so we, and of course, the Passover lamb, the lamb of God, we've studied those things. And so all these things are always pointing to the Messiah, pointing to the Messiah. Even today, as we looked at uh, Acts chapter three, all these things point to the Messiah. The Lord told, or Peter told, the Jewish crowd there at the temple. And so we see that uh, the Lord says the Passover or the, the um, that is his mine. And Moses said to the people, remember this day in which we, we went out of Egypt. And that's going to be the key. Uh, even to this day, God seared this in their hearts. This was something that was going to keep Israel, Israel. Benjamin Disraeli. Uh, the uh, great, he was a Jewish, uh, he was a Jew, one of the only prime ministers of Europe, uh, and he was in the 1800s in, uh, uh, in London, or in, in England, he was prime minister of England. And uh, he was a Christian Jew, and he said, I could tell you one way I know the Bible's true, and, and he said, I could use two words. And someone said, well, what are those two words? And he said, the Jew. In other words, how that God has has as in how the God has done and they kept the Jewish nation together now over uh, 2,700 years or, or since uh, they were dispersed as a nation uh, 
or they came back to, well, actually, since from the Babylonian captivity. And then, of course, 2,000 years since the time that they were dispersed from a nation, as a nation, and the temple was burned. And yet the Jews, for all their problems, God has kept them together because God, they are God's people. They are his firstborn. And so we see that, uh, and, and so in verse 3, as we see that he said, Out of the house of bondage, for by, uh, for by strength of hand, the Lord brought you out of this place. And we're again this morning, that hand that's lifted down. How are we, how does God bring us out of the place? He lifts us up, but what do we have to do? We have to grab his hand. And so what a beautiful picture that was. Uh, to me, I just kind of, this thing about you love the Bible, You, the more you study it, the more you realize you didn't know what, I mean, something every time you read, uh, you go through a book. And uh, I think Rob was t- talking about this the other day. He said, oh, I just wish I knew more about the Bible. I wish I'd learned this earlier. That's what I still say today. I wish I'd learned this earlier. You know, everything that you learn about the Bible, you wish you'd learned 20 years ago. But we see that he said, and he shall, and it shall be when the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites and of the Hittites and the Amorites and the Hevites and the Jebusites, which you swear uh, that he swore to your fathers to give you. There again, notice how they keep going back historically. Um, and to give you a land flowing with milk and honey that you shall keep this service, uh, on this month. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. So notice that he has instituted in, ch- in chapter 12, the Passover. But now that unleavened bread is going to be uh, start before the Passover. And it's going to be a whole week. And the Passover now is going to last about two weeks as far as all the things that go on. It says, uh, seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. And on the seventh day, you shall have a feast to the Lord. God, it just occurred to me. Here's something else I never had thought about. When did the Lord go to the Sea of Galilee? John gives us a specific time. Or excuse me, when uh, was it the, the second time when Thomas? Uh, but when, when did, it says eight days later. Why? Because it was after the resurrection, and it was after the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And so so there again, uh, every time the Bible puts something specific in there, um, and there's so many things that uh, I have to go back, when was it, after when he met with Thomas, or was it uh, at the um, the Sea of Galilee? Either one of those, I remember the eight days, so I'll have to go back and uh, and scratch my head on that one. But uh, notice it says, seven... Uh, unleavened bread shall you eat seven days, and no leavened bread shall be among you. Now, what does leaven represent? Sin. And if you remember our Jewish brother who came and talked about how that the Jews, even to today, uh, before the Passover, they will make a game of it. But the the it is very important that they clear out their house from any unleavened bread. That means all their uh, um, their. The names of the bread. What what are some of the names of the bread that we have uh, up there? I'm just uh, drawing a uh, Marita bread was one I remember as a kid. But uh, um, Sara Lee and all the rest, anything that was uh, um, that was has leaven in it was to be taken out of the house. And um, he says, and no leavened bread shall be seen among you. Uh, there goes your breakfast bagels. Um, not, uh, nor shall leaven be seen among you in your quarters. And boy, there goes your peach pie too. So, but you know, but start thinking about all that. <laughs> but the notice is, and you shall, uh, tell your sons in that day. Notice how important it is. You tell your son and especially that firstborn, right? Because that was the office. I mean, that was the, the spiritual, that was going to be the person who was responsible for the spiritual head of the family. And you shall tell your son in that day, this is done because the Lord did for me, uh, what the Lord did for me when I came from Egypt. And so it was vitally important. And so we see now, and he's going to tell them how to remember it. He says, and it shall be a sign to you on your hand as a memorial before your eyes and we see over in verse 36, and it shall be a sign on your hand and frontlets to your eyes. And so 
uh, this would be something you'd put on your forehead, and they, these were called phylacteries, if you remember the Lord. said, oh, you Pharisees, you have your phylacteries, but you don't even know what you're, you're doing. Uh, you you uh, strain out a gnat and you swallow a camel. All those things that he talked about, because they, by the time the Lord Jesus came, they uh, during the Babylonian captivity, they would actually wear things on their head. They would have... Um, they would have these, this verse or about the Passover. They would also have Deuteronomy chapter six, which is called the, uh, Mishnah or which is, um, uh, or the Shema. I'm sorry. Uh, which is hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one God and thou shalt worship him with all thy heart, soul and mind. And thou shalt teach your kids, your sons and your sons' sons. And they would have that on their little phylactery. And then there were a couple other verses that they, uh, and many, some of the uh, Orthodox Jews still do that today. But uh, think about this, though. He says, on your uh, head and on your hands. Now, who's the great counterfeiter? Satan. And when he comes along, he's going to have a little sign for people to wear. And where will it be placed? On their foreheads and on their hands. Isn't it interesting how the devil, just like it seems like, the world's crowd today who's under the control of Satan seems like they're just going through the Bible and saying, whatever God says, we're going to do just the opposite. All these attacks on gender and on uh, on morality, all these different things, are. it's almost like Satan's going through and controlling people's minds and saying, let's do this because God says do that. And so here we see that uh, um, even Satan uh, can read the Bible and he trembles. But notice in verse 11, And it shall be that when the Lord brings you into the land of Canaan, the Canaanites, as he swore to you and your fathers, and gives you uh, that you shall sanctify or set apart uh, to the Lord all that open the womb and every firstborn that comes uh, of an animal. Now, where did these animals go once you set them apart? Well, uh, that was one way to keep the Levites satisfied. But that was also um, a way that they would be dedicated because if you took the firstborn of the sheep and it had to be firstborn, then uh, during the Passover or the Day of Atonement, you would take pick one of those sheep uh, as from the firstborn who was without what? Blemish or without spot? Does that point you to anybody? To the Lord Jesus, of course. And so all this was wrapped up in the fact that, as uh, Peter said in Acts chapter th- uh, 4, or 3, excuse me, when he said uh, all the, 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 all these things and these prophecies were fulfilled in Jesus. And so we see that um, uh, the firstborn, the animals which you have, the males shall be the Lord's, but every firstborn of the donkey. Now it's interesting, out of all the animals that a rancher or a, a, a shepherd might have, we, he picks out the donkey that you shall redeem uh, with a lamb. In other words, you pay for that donkey uh, and with a, with a lamb. Now, if you don't do that, and if you don't get, sacrifice that or give it to uh, the Levites, then uh, you break his neck. In other words, the firstborn of the donkey is you buy it. You buy it from me, and that's one way I'm going to support the Levites or whatever else. And so... But it, but that word donkey, or you know, of course, the word, uh, of course, the King, the King James uses ass. Uh, you study that uh, animal in the Bible, and there was only one smart one, and that was the one that uh, Balaam wrote, wrote. And isn't that interesting? God used a donkey, a female donkey, to just show a man how silly he was by defying him. <laughs> but all the rest of them, you know, the um, one of the um, the tribes of Israel would be called a wild ass, you know, and all the different things. And you think of, uh, in Proverbs, it talks about don't be like a donkey. Uh, all these uh, terms that are used. And so <laughs> that was one animal that the Lord said, you know, uh, if you have donkeys, and they are beasts of burdens, uh, that uh, you offer something for him. And, of course, that becomes a picture of type of sinful man and stubbornness and all the rest that man has, and man has to be redeemed. Remember that Exodus is a book of redemption. And so he keeps talking about redemption. You have to be redeemed. 
uh, and you shall redeem it with the lamb. Uh, and it, uh, and if you don't redeem it, but you break its neck and all the firstborn of men among your sons, you shall redeem. So it shall come be when your sons ask you in time to come, what is this that you shall say to them? Uh, by strength of hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Do you remember what, uh, what Joseph and Mary did after their firstborn? They circumcised them on the eighth day and eighth day, and then about two months later, they took them to the temple with what? Redemption. Turtle up, because they were so poor they couldn't even, they didn't even own a lamb. And so there again, this was still practiced, and, and Joseph and Mary did everything exactly as Moses and God had demanded or commanded back in the book of Exodus. It's just marvelous to look at uh, everything. They carried out those, uh, those, this ritual or these things totally as God said. Why? Because they had a sinless son. And so we see that, uh, this was true in, uh, uh, all the way through the Lord Jesus time. And it came to pass in verse 15 that when Pharaoh was stubborn about letting us go, that the Lord, uh, killed all the firstborn of the land of Egypt. So this is the reason you're going to do this because God took care of the firstborn, but he wants our firstborn. Uh, both the firstborn of man and the firstborn of beast. Therefore, I sacrifice to the Lord all the males that open the womb, but all the firstborn of my sons I redeem. And so that's the reason Mary and Joseph went to the temple. And it shall be as a sign uh, on your hand and in the frontlets of your eyes, for by strength of hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt. The hand was extended. Now in verse 17, it says, Then it came to pass, when Pharaoh had let the people go, that God did not lead them by the land of the Philistines. Now the shortest route would have been just to go right up across the Nile and right on up uh, into uh, the land, it's only about uh, 30 to 50 miles. But God didn't lead them north. He led them east. Now, with that, if you, and this is why Rob, kind of, I'm wanting to get some things set up, but uh, if you have a map, you'll notice that uh, the Red Sea uh, forks into uh, two. I mean, like a finger two. And you have the west side, which uh, uh, would form part of the what, the Sinai Peninsula slicks down between it, although it's not really the Sinai Peninsula. If, as we looked at the um, CD, uh, we'll talk about this in a moment, but uh, actually what they did, they came up and they went all across the Sinai Peninsula because the Lord told them that they were going back to uh, Mount Horeb. That's where the God was going to set up and that's where he was going to give them the law. And he said, Moses, you're going to come back to this place. And um, Mount Horeb was in Midian because, you know, he, uh, uh, Moses was a shepherd in Midian. I thought that meant that he went, they went across the Sinai Peninsula. If you look at Sinai, would have been in between my fingers. And they actually came over to the sea, uh, to the east side, the east finger, as you look. Or if you look at a map, it'd be the one on the right. And so they came across that, that, uh, land what we call the Sinai Peninsula today, which we know is a very hot place. I mean, it's uh, both uh, politically, but also we know that it's a lot of desert, wilderness, as the Bible calls it. And so they got out of there. So we see, it says, and he led the people around uh, by the wilderness of the Red Sea. And the children of Israel went up in orderly ranks, or as uh, again, we uh, sometimes just uh, armies and other times it's orderly ranks but that's what armies are it doesn't mean they're armed with weapons uh although they had to beat some in to uh, plow their shot plowshares into some weapons because they did have to fight later on but uh, we see that uh they came up in orderly ranks out of the land of egypt and moses took the bones of joseph remember what joseph had asked or told demanded he said now i'm going to die here in egypt but when you leave here, take my bones with you. And again, we see uh, the promises that God had made. And although it was going to be 400 years later or close to 400 years later, we know that, uh, um, that, Mo that Joseph, this was a step of faith for him. 
God will lead you out of this land. And so this was in the back of Israel's mind, even in Egypt. Uh, and under uh, the solemn oath, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry my bones from, uh, from here with you. So they took the journey from Sukkoth, and they camped in Etham in the edge of the wilderness, and the Lord went before them in a pillar of cloud to lead the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, so as to go by day and night. He did not take away the pillar of the cloud by day or the pillar of fire by night, from before them. For the next 40 years, now they're going to be led by this pillar of fire and the pillar of light. Now, someone gave me back a few years ago a picture, and this is actually a picture after they set up the tabernacle, and I'll uh, we'll put it up somewhere in the auditorium. But actually, you know, a pillar is not uh, a pillow, but actually it's just a streak of fire by night, and then, of course, the cloud at, uh, during the day. And... Um, so we said now there's all there's there's all kind of significance in that. So we'll just put this over here. You can look at it later, or um, well, I'm afraid to put it anywhere. We'll slide down, but if you we'll we'll put it up in the auditorium somewhere because we'll be talking about this for a while uh, during as we look at uh, the migrations of of Israel. And so we see that uh, now the Lord spake to Moses, saying, "Speak to the children of Israel that they turn." And camp in, in uh, Pereth Harath, uh, between Migdal and the sea. Now, if this pillar of cloud, or this, you know, if this cloud by day and fire by night was leading them, then this didn't make a bit of sense, I'm sure, to Pharaoh. Because they weren't going north, they were going east. And not only east, but they're going kind of south, southeast. Because they, they were going down into the the Sinai Peninsula, uh, rather than uh, north. And of course, uh, I imagine a lot of the people were saying, hey, listen, uh, as far as I know, Canaan is that away. You know? Um, let's see, I lose my bearings here, but uh, north is that away, isn't it? No, that's south. That's north is this way. So um, again, we see that, uh, that he said, wait a minute, he's leading us that away instead of this way. And so nobody really understood it. But God's ways don't always make the most sense, but they're always the right way, are they not? I mean, the world can tell you all kinds of things. No wonder the Bible tells us to walk not in the counsel of the ungodly. Because God's ways don't always make the most sense to the world. And it certainly didn't, surely didn't make sense to a lot of the Israelites, nor to Pharaoh. For Pharaoh will say to the children of Israel, they are bewildered. See, the Lord already knew that Pharaoh and the world would be, uh, would be confused or, or disdaining what was going on. And the wilderness has closed them in. Uh, there's people, they can't, you know, here you got two million people left. There's no way they're going to survive out there in that barren, hot desert. And how can they? And so I'm going to go out before they all die. And I'm going to rescue them. I'm going to go with my armies and I'm going to take care of any of the rebels and then I'll bring them back in. He goes, hey, listen, we missed their service. Uh, then I will burden Pharaoh's heart so that he will pursue them. Notice how that once a person has got to a, a certain point in their life, God uses them against themselves. And that's what uh, you must be, we must be concerned about is that... Uh, that phrase in the Bible that really haunts me or as far as uh, our nation or whatever is where I think it's Hosea says, uh, Ephraim has joined himself to idols. Let him alone. And Ephraim soon, that's northern Israel, was destroyed. And uh, I don't want God to say to, uh, to, uh, to himself or to the angels uh, or the Holy Spirit especially, uh, Dan Lashley has joined himself to idols. Just leave him alone. I'll use him the way, I mean, I'll use him against himself. And we know that throughout history, God has done that. Uh, the heart of man is in the hand of the Lord, and he, got, he, he leadeth wherever he will. And so even a wicked king, and we talked about King Cyrus and others, they are led by the Lord, uh, whether they like it or not. If they, 
if you go voluntarily, it's a blessing. If you go contrary to the Lord, he still uses you and it's a curse. And so we see that I will burden Pharaoh's heart so that he will pursue them and I will gain honor over Pharaoh and over his army and the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord. Now think about that. I will gain honor from whom? Well, you remember later on, uh, whenever they get to Rahab and uh, Rahab the harlot, and she's talking to the spy, she says, we know what the Lord did uh, to the Egyptian army. Uh, the Philistines later on in Samuel's day says, you know, this is the God that destroyed Pharaoh's army. And so throughout the Old Testament, I mean, the one thing that feared them, uh, they feared was a God who can destroy the most powerful army in the world. And so we got to be careful with this God. And it really, I think it surprised the Philistines when they defeated the, the, uh, the and they probably really thought that they <laughs> had conquered God, um, whenever during the days of Eli, how that, uh, they captured the ark. But what happened with the ark? They finally, they got rid of it after what that, uh, the presence of God did to their idols. And so all these things we see that, uh, uh, there were nations around that understood that what the Lord had done. Now, it was told the king of Egypt that the people had fled, and the heart of Pharaoh and his servants was turned against the people. Notice again how the God is changing hearts. Now, it's only been less than a week, and they they had great more. They haven't even finished the funerals yet. Some of them haven't even been started. And yet their hearts are already turned from mourning, M-O-U-R-N, to, um, to now uh, anger or whatever else. And so he said, uh, when the, uh, he says, they turn their hearts against the people. Uh, why have you done this? And uh, why have you let Israel go uh, from serving us? So the people are already saying this. So that he made ready the chariots and took his people with him. And he took 600 choice chariots. I mean, chariots were like tanks back then. And that's just the choice ones. And all the chariots of Egypt. So there, there was the advanced guard, the, the very best of the best. And then there were the rest that came along. So there may be a couple of thousand chariots that were coming. And can you imagine the landscape? Uh, Cecil DeMille uh, used 12,000 people to try to depict that in the Ten Commandments. 12,000 people. And if he had made that film today, it would have cost well over $100 million. Uh, just uh, And uh, DeMille was kind of an interesting man. Uh, his mother was a Jew. His father was, a, I guess, a Protestant. He'd really, but he, they did take him to church when he was young. And uh, with her influence as a Jew, and the Bible knowledge he picked up in Sunday school and church, uh, he he was mesmerized with the Old Testament. And he, uh, even though he was, well, yeah, you have to wonder about him because he also uh, was an immoral man. But uh, Samson to Deliah, the Exodus. Uh, uh, he, uh, but the thing that, that people, and even uh, many Christian people who've looked at his films, and I, I'm not that much of a film girl, but they say they are amazingly accurate. Because he really studied to make sure that he had it down the way that they should be, and but even with twelve thousand people, he couldn't he couldn't quite grasp it as far as because it, this was a huge situation. You're talking about thousands of chariots, then you have troops after them. I mean, that's what you do. Your infantry comes after your chariots, just like the tanks and to, uh, today and all that. They work together, so you had this huge army out there. And if you have a, a couple of thousand or at least a thousand chariots out there, you can imagine what that must have looked like across the plain coming across that flat land in the desert. And then, of course, you must have thought with the children of Israel, what, what a huge sight that must have been, a sitting duck out there in the middle of the, of the uh, desert with all the women and children that couldn't really move. And so the Lord was putting Israel in a totally impossible situation because he wanted notice he said because I want to receive the glory and it's by my hand not yours Moses not by your military prowess 
but I'm going to show the world what I can do. And so we see that, um, and also 600 choice chariots uh, uh, with the with the captains over every one of them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, there it is again, of Egypt. And he pursued the children of Israel, and the children of Israel went out with boldness. So the Egyptians pursued them, uh, all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh and his horsemen and his army. And they overtook them. Uh, camping by the sea beside Paharoth, whatever, Belsavon. And from what we have seen in the film, uh, back, remember that, the only bad thing about that film, it was two hours long. And, uh, it was, you know, we learned to have to divide that up. But, um, if you haven't seen that, uh, CD, we have it up here and we'll loan it out to you so you can see it. But, uh, really, it's pretty well been established that, uh, it wasn't that east or that western side of the finger that sticks up uh, next to the Nile, but it was over across there where uh, you know it goes up uh, where present day uh, Saudi Arabia was is, and so we see that um, that they crossed that Sinai Peninsula, uh, and uh, and so they were sitting ducks because the Lord turned them southeast, and so they would have run right into that sea. And when Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes. Now notice they went out with boldness in verse 8. But when Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. So they were very afraid, and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. And then they said to Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away from to die in this wilderness? It's your fault, Moses, we're going to die. Now, isn't that interesting how fickle a man can be? They go out and bold us, and it doesn't take but one little test, and they're ready to blame others and all that. Let's go back to Egypt. Let's surrender. Oh, the fickleness of man. And we see, and we will see this time and time and time again uh, in the wilderness wanderings. How many times do you see, oh, we, we, we love the leeks and garlics, all the vegetables of Egypt, and let's go back. All the different things that uh, we see where they, every time they had a problem, they wanted to go back to Egypt. But isn't the, that the way that our old flesh is? Every time we have a little bit of test, we either want to go to the world or we want to give in to the flesh. And so we see that um, because there were no graves in Egypt, and it's in verse, he said, why have you dealt with us to bring us out of Egypt? Is this not the word that we were told in Egypt saying, let us alone that we, hey, didn't we tell you to leave, leave us alone? We were happy to be with the Egyptians. No, no, you hadn't said that. It's amazing what happens when people get a little afraid. And so we see that he says, for it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians that we should die in the wilderness. <laughs> oh, Moses, no wonder. God has to argue, or Moses an argument. Uh, Moses and, and the Lord gets an argument time and time again over these stiff-necked people. But then in verse thirteen, and Moses said to the people, and this is this is the verse that you need to underline. Fear not. Uh, it, uh, the King James says, "Fear not. Stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord. Fear not." Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Now, what does perfect love cast out? First John chapter 4 says, Perfect love, that's a trust and a respect for the person you love, casts out all fear. And so if we're fearful, then that's a test of our love. And so we see that the Lord tells us, uh, Fear not. Uh, can we put our total trust in the Lord and find peace in Him when it looks like the impossible situation? And what do we do when we put our trust in Him? After you've done everything you can and you're right in the middle of God's will as far as you know, and this is what I tell people when they get in trouble, especially uh, marital problems or whatever else, make sure that you're in the center of God's will. There's no sin that uh, you have not confessed. Make sure that you have totally given your heart to the Lord and yes, uh, if there are things that you need to get right with him or with other people, get right with him. And then after you've done all, what does the Bible say, tell us in, in uh, Ephesians chapter 6? Having done all, stand. 
if you've done everything. And so here these people were obedient. They were exactly where God wanted them to be. And now God says, fear not, stand still, and you will see what I can do. And so this is what we, as Christians, we have to wait on the Lord. How many times have we seen that uh, as we've gone through the book of Psalms? Waiting, okay, I want to make sure that I am in the center of God's will and that I am extolling him for who he is. And remember how many times we looked at David, how that he just kept building God up in his mind, no matter what problems he had. And he, he wanted to make sure he was right in the center of God's will. And time after time, God delivered him. And I didn't do it, but God did it. That's what God wants us to be able to say. He wants us to be able to say with Saul, my, or Paul, my strength is made perfect in your what? Weakness. And I've learned that whatever state I am, therewith to be fearful, right? Whatever state I am, and to be content. So that's all part of the Christian exercise, as we would exercise ourselves to godliness. And so we see that he says, Fear not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, and what he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall not see again. Wait, that big old huge army out there, thousands of people, the Lord, Lord, you say that, but look at those chariots. You know, look at all that gleaming armor out there. Look at those shields and those swords just gleaming in the sun. And Lord, they're coming after us. We're going to die. And look at my kids. What are going to happen to my kids? They'll kill me and take my kids back. All kinds of things that uh, they were thinking. And he said, the Egyptian whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. That's pretty definite. The Lord will fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. One of the verses that God gave me one time uh, is Isaiah chapter 30. And I was in kind of a situation. I didn't know what to do. And boy, I just wanted to say things, and I wanted to straighten it out. But I knew that the more I talked, the worse it was going to get. And so the Lord gave me the verse in Isaiah chapter 30, where he said, in silence and in confidence is your strength. You know, God worked it out. I mean, he put me in a position where I could not do anything. And I really didn't have a whole lot of confidence in him, to be honest with you. But I have a lot more confidence after it happened. And so what he did, and that is not that what happens, tribulation works experience. And so here we see, that uh, hold your peace and God will take care of it. Now, notice what this, this Shekinah glory. Now, the, and we, didn't, we don't have time tonight. We will come back to it later or later study. But this, uh, the, the, that we will see that the Lord spoke. How did God speak to the children of Israel? How did God speak to Moses? He spoke through the cloud. When you get to the New Testament, uh, we see that... Uh, uh, that, and we'll see this cloud many times, especially at uh, Mount Horeb or Mount Sinai. We will see it, uh, uh, Horeb was the, or Mount Sinai was a range, Horeb was a specific mountain. Uh, we don't know exactly where that is. Um, so it's so interesting how many things we don't know in the Bible. Uh, we don't know exactly where the Red Sea crossing was. We don't know exactly where Jesus was born. We know he was born in a cave, but we don't know which cave. Uh, we know that he uh, was loaned a tomb, but we don't know what tomb. Uh, but why? And we know that Moses was buried, but we don't know where. Well, all, there's a lot of things that God hides from us. Why? Because he knows we'll worship them rather than worshiping the Lord. We don't even have the original, uh, uh, the original transcripts that God gives us through the Bible. Why? Because we'd worship that rather than reading it. And so God knows what he's doing by taking care of things like that. In verse 15, and the Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? Moses, hey Moses, I brought you this far. Why are you crying? Moses is going through his trials too. Tell the people of the children of Israel to go forward. What? Lord, there's a big old ocean out there. And I can't even see to the other side. He said, go forward. But lift up, what? What was in your hand, Moses? Rod. rod. How many times have we seen that? What's in your hand, Moses? And that rod does all kinds of interesting things through the power of God. He said, uh, lift up your rod and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it. 
And the children of Israel will go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. Now, this is where some skeptics say, no, this wasn't the Red Sea. This was the Red Sea, the Reed Sea, I'm sorry, that's up in the northern reach of, regions of, of Egypt. And it was only a few, uh, few feet of water. And really, they didn't walk on dry ground. It didn't have enough time to dry. Uh, they walked kind of through the mud, and that's what uh, bogged down the, the Egyptian chariots. Well, just think about that. Uh, that means that the Lord destroyed the largest army in the world with ankle-deep water. Uh, I would uh, think uh, that uh, God could do a better job than that, don't you? But uh, here we see that he, uh, the Lord controls the waters. And we see that, um, that uh, this was a bona fide sea. Can you imagine? There again, having a family of four, or four kids, and my wife, can you imagine walking through, and the Bible says, and we'll see here that the, the water was piled up on each side. Can you imagine walking through a canyon of water? I mean, that must have been something. And now, of course, it had to be at least a couple hundred yards wide so that they could uh, walk through it with that many people. And But no, they weren't going to be able to get across there. It probably took them a couple of days to get across there. I mean, you got two million people. And they've got to walk across at least a 10-mile stretch of water. And it says, um, And the children of Israel uh, shall go down on dry ground through the mist of the sea, and I indeed will harden the hearts of the Egyptians, and they will follow them, so that I will gain honor over Pharaoh and his army, and his chariots and his horsemen. Then the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord, uh, and I have gained honor for myself over Pharaoh and his chariots and his horsemen. And the angel of God, who went before the camp of Israel, now here, we'll come back to this later because we're running out of time. The angel of God is, and we'll see in Isaiah and other places, how that God spoke through the clouds. And you notice the angel of God in the Old Testament, is what well, is um, is Jesus Christ pre-incarnate, and so here we have a picture of the Lord Jesus as He works, and He's not an angel of the Lord, but the angel of God. And notice that in my Bible is a is a capital A, the angel of God, the Shekinah glory. That's what angel of God actually means. So the Shekinah led them, and it was a cloud. And we know the Lord spoke to the children of Israel in a cloud. The Lord spoke to uh, the disciples in a cloud. The Lord at the baptism in a cloud said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. So this Shekinah glory is actually the very presence of God. And so we see, and the angel of God Shall went before him. And by the way, how's the Lord coming back? In the clouds. And where we're going to go? We're going to go into the clouds to meet him in the air. And so, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And so we see that, uh, and the angel of God who went before the camp of Israel moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud went uh, be, uh, from before them and stood behind them. So notice this is actually a picture of the Holy Spirit. Uh, the, he was a covering. Uh, it was the cloud. Uh, can you imagine walking across a 120 degree desert? No, the cloud cooled it down for their feet. The cloud protected them from the Egyptian army. The cloud moved before them and behind them. He takes care of our enemies behind and he points the way and prepares the way to go ahead. And so, and so it came that between the, the uh, camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel, this, or thus it was a cloud and darkness to the, uh, to one, and it gave light by night to the other. So what does God do with us? You know, Jesus is the light of the world. But what, what, where does the, where does the world dwell? In darkness. So he's our light. But he's darkness to those who refuse to accept him. The, the, the Bible tells us to them that peri perish, the, 
it, it's foolishness, it's darkness. And so we see that cloud represents all that the Lord wants it to here as the Shekinah glory. And we see that and it gave light by night and the other so that uh, they did not come near the other. And then Moses stretched forth his hand over the sea and the Lord caused the sea to go back with a strong east wind. So that would be coming across uh, Saudi Arabia um, uh, at night and made the sea into dry land and the waters were divided so the children of israel went in the midst of the sea on dry ground and the waters were a wall on their right hand and on their left now even if it was four feet of water that's still a miracle isn't it i mean you just don't divide water i mean if, with me i, I, I mean if, if he caused it and there had to be that had to be a tunnel wind to divide the water that way I mean, he, really, the only way that we could have done it was to push the water all to one side. But God divided the waters. Why? Because he's, he's capable of doing it. And the Egyptians pursued and went uh, uh, after them uh, into the midst of the sea, all the Pharaoh's horses and his children and his chariots and his horsemen. And it came to pass in the morning watch that the Lord looked down upon the army of the Egyptians and they were gaining ground. Through the pil- notice through the pillar of fire and cloud, and he troubled the army of the Egyptians, and he took off their chariot wheels. Now, back a few weeks ago, there was uh, a race car driver, and he was going a couple hundred miles an hour on one of those indie style cars, and his front wheel came off. And uh, when you're going 200 miles an hour, you don't want that wheel to come off, uh, and you don't definitely don't want to be around a car that has a will come off like that. Um, and it caused, I mean, actually, uh, his pit crew got banned. I mean, they, I mean, they were severely punished and they can't, I think there's, they still can't have a race until, uh, because that's one of their penalties for letting something that dangerous happen. But isn't it interesting? Uh, the Lord knew how to take care of all the chariots and their wheels came off so that uh, and you can imagine how those chariot drivers must have felt. And so that they, Drove and how those those wheels must have started hitting each other and killing some of the some of their own people, so that they drove them with difficulty. And the Egyptians said, "Let us flee from the face of Israel, for the Lord Jehovah, this Jehovah God that's caused us so many problems." And a couple of weeks ago, uh, he says, "The Lord Jehovah fights for them against the Egyptians. Even the enemies knew." Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea and the waters shall come back on the Egyptians, on the, on their chariots and on their horsemen. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. And when the morning appeared, the sea returned in full depth while the Egyptians were fleeing into it. So the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea and the waters returned and covered the chariots and the, and the horsemen and all the army of Pharaoh and it came to see after to do them uh, came after them not so much as one of them not one this is one of the greatest battles in all of history one of the greatest human battles in history was the battle of Cannae, where the romans went after hannibal, uh, after hannibal and uh hannibal had a magnificent uh, strategy and he destroyed 90% of the Roman army. And the, the military historians still look at that as one of the greatest strategies, and they try to work out, uh, boy, I'd love to go and I'd love the, those things, but uh, just how he did it, and they still study these things in military schools today, both Russia and here. Uh, just uh, And yet, that was only 90%, and that was the greatest battle in history. Think about 100% casualties and of the strongest army in the world. Not the Lord taking out one of our aircraft carriers, but all 12. You think that might cause a problem? Not taking out uh, uh, just a few helicopters, but, but everything that we send against the enemy. You think that would cause a few problems? And would it be a worldwide phenomenon that even the Chinese probably hear about? And so, and of course, even back at this time. And so we see in verse 20, and so the waters returned, and not one of them remained. 
And the children of Israel had to walk on dry land and the midst of the sea and the waters were a wall to them on their right and left. And the Lord saved the land, uh, the Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw, and this must have been gruesome, the Egyptians dead, washed up on the seashore. I mean, just thousands of guys, of uh, men, washed up on the seashore. Uh, thus the Lord saw the great, uh, the Israel saw the great work the Lord had done in Egypt. So the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant. Now in chapter 15, we'll see next week, the first psalm in the Bible. It's the song of the redeemed. You realize one thing, another, another thing I didn't realize, you never see the angels singing in the Bible because uh, and even whether, and of course that messes up a lot of Christmas cards, but uh, you remember uh, where the angels, they did not sing with the shepherds. They were praising God, but we don't hear them singing because singing is reserved for the redeemed. What does the Lord tell us since we are redeemed and filled with the Spirit? God tells us singing to ourselves and psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. The biggest book in the Bible is songs to the redeemed or of the redeemed. And so we'll see, and then we'll see the whole key to the book of Exodus in chapter 15. The, the, the key verse is in the middle of the psalm. And so uh, God's a great God, isn't he? What he's done for others, and what he's done for the Egyptians or to the Egyptians and for the Israelites, what he can do for you. He's still the same God. I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Moses. And he's still the same God, the first and the last, he that was and is and will be. He's the eternal God, and he's our refuge. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Oh, Lord, use it for your glory in our lives. Make us stronger. May we see how that all interconnects. And it is all scripture is given by the inspiration of God. And it is profitable for us to meditate upon it because we see your ways and we understand what you have done for others. As, as Paul said, these things were an example of you working in the hearts of the Israelites. And Lord, and how that now you're working in the hearts of the church. And so we pray your blessings upon us as we seek to do your will in your way, may we fear not and stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Let's